Welcome, Maria Ressa. Yes, please take your seats. Welcome to the book launch of Maria Ressa's How to Stand Up to a Dictator. This is her third book and her first after winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021. This is her first book launch in the Philippines, outside of Manila, so we are deeply honored to be chosen as part of her Philippine book tour. She just landed in Manila two days ago after going to Paris, to London, and to Cologne in Germany. And so as not to break the rhythm, we will have the Cordilleran dance troupe Saon Yakasai to welcome Maria Ressa, followed, oh, actually they have welcomed her already, and now they will show us her, their cultural presentation. And we hope that uh, Kidlat is on his way, because after the cultural presentation of Saon Yakasai, we will have a um, blessing, a ritual, by none other than our national artist for film, Kidlat Dahinik. But before that, let us welcome back to stage, Sao Nyakasai.
you to sound your castle for that wonderful and beautiful performance. They are an award-winning dance troupe, by the way. And here they are! Let's do some community dancing! That was such a wonderful community dance, and thank you to everyone who joined us. All right, so uh, let's settle down, and while the others are still getting their books, and some are still registering, and while we prepare the stage, we shall have a five-minute breather. <laughs> Even I lost my breath. Okay, so five minutes, and then we shall proceed. Thank you very much. Okay. So just a little background before we begin. So, uh, by the way, I'm Mia. I'm from the Baguio Chronicle. And 
uh, I think it was last December when Frank Simato and I, Frank's our editor-in-chief, we were thinking out loud to the Rappler team if we could host Maria Ressa, um, if we could host her book lunch here in Baguio. Alam naman namin suntok sa buwan yun eh. After all, Maria Ressa's schedule is like that Oscar um, contender, that movie. You know, it's everything, everywhere, all at once. She is that. <laughs> I mean, just two days ago, she just arrived from Paris, London, and Germany, and now she's with us here in Baguio. <laughs> well, when, when, we, when we bounced that idea off to the Rappler team last December, lo and behold, Frank got a call from Rappler editor Gigi Go. Oh. And she said it was a go. It would be on May 31. <laughs> Okay, so we had two months. We were okay with that. Then Frank got another call. March 31 na daw. Siyempre, okay, we can still breathe. Then I think it was two weeks ago, I March 6 na lang. <laughs> and you know what? We still said yay! <laughs> because it would be so perfect. Not only would we have the opportunity to have Maria join us here for a book lunch, but for Women's Month as well. <laughs> of course, it was a logistical nightmare <laughs> for me and Frank. One thing is, we couldn't post very openly about it because we wanted, we wanted to, make, uh, to keep Maria safe and secure and we only had clearance to post the poster a day before. So what we did, and I think where most of you signed up, was through the secret messenger <laughs> thing. So we passed, on, we passed on our messages through private message and that's how all of us are now gathered here. Yay! <laughs> now, as for the venue, there can only be one place. The University of the Cordilleras. After all, this is where Maria Ressa got her honoris, ca honoris causa in 2019. And that was made possible by Ray Dean Salvosa, the son of the founder of UC, and longtime president of the school. Now, we have Raven Salvosa for the welcome remarks. But before that, let us welcome to the stage, Maria Ressa. And we have one of our famous flower designers, Paulite Antonius, to give his specially made strawberry bouquet for Maria. Thank you so much, Paula. So his shot is at Antonius at Ililikha. And we now have who just arrived, no other than our national artist for film, Kidlat Tahinik. Please join us on stage. And I turn over the mic to Aidin Salvosa. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Maria. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for being here today on this, uh, what I consider to be a very important event. It is an honor and a privilege for the University of the Cordilleras in partnership with Rappler, Maria's home organization, the Baguio Chronicle, and Fully Book Bookstore to host this very important and significant event. The Baguio launch of 
Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa is very significant because I cannot begin to tell you how important this book is. It is more than an autobiography. The book, How, stand up to a Di to be, how to Stand Up to a Dictator, in this digital age of social media, provides us with the opportunity to listen to one of the most significant voices of our time with an even more significant and important message. It is also a very important moment, a very important special moment for us to welcome back our 2019 commencement speaker whom the university honored with a special citation then, citing her as a profile in courage in her battle for truth and press freedom against all odds. With the might and power of the Duterte administration threatening her organization, Rappler, with closure, as well as the issuance of some nine arrest warrants against her. Yet they failed to silence her. And all the threats against her, not just by government, but by the new enemy called trolls and social media, capacitated and encouraged by big tech and the digital age, has only forced her to move on to a bigger stage for her crusade that went beyond our borders and enabled her to bring this very important message worldwide because the problem we face is not just in the Philippines, it is worldwide. I first started to follow Maria when she was CNN's bureau chief, I am an avid news watcher, and she was CNN's bureau chief in Manila and Jakarta in the 80s and in the 90s, and was also CNN's lead investigative reporter covering terrorism. At the time, I was a professor, and one of the courses I taught was a course in political terrorism. So she had a lot to teach me because she was there. She eventually became News and Current Affairs Division Head of ABS-CBN, a network that has now been closed by the Duterte administration. But in that job, she oversaw the work of over a thousand journalists and reporters. Many of you may not know it, but she is also a teacher, an academic. She was a professor of courses teaching politics and terrorism in her alma mater, Princeton University, and also taught broadcast journalism at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Before this book, she also authored two equally important books that was unfortunately known mostly to journalists and political scientists and professors, but you can order both books in Lazada and Amazon. It is still available. The first book is Seeds of Terror, an eyewitness account of Al-Qaeda's newest center of operations in Southeast Asia, which she published in 2003. And the second book, which was really a precursor to her current book, is titled, From Bin Laden to Facebook, and she wrote this in 2012. We are in awe of, having, of her having been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, the first Filipino to win what is perhaps the world's most prestigious recognition for what she has contributed to the betterment of mankind. But her work, even when you read the book, you will see it's just a beginning. Although autobiographical, its more important message is the story she narrates of the world's movement towards authoritarianism, of political power being used against democracies, 
abetted and aided, though inadvertently, by big tech and social media companies like Facebook. That is the message we need to understand and learn how to battle against. And it is, it is made more dangerous every day by the fact that there seems to be no one immune from the reach of this insidious move to control and influence our minds and the minds of our children because it is right in the palm of our heads. Right through this instrument that is in the hands of our children, our students, our teachers, you name it. As educators, as parents, as community activists and leaders, and even just as responsible citizens who love our country, we need to heed the lessons he imparts to us in what I consider to be one of the most important books of our time. Maria, we honor you and thank you for what you do and what you continue to do for those who love freedom and democracy and truth. Welcome, Maria. <clears throat> Thank you for that heartwarming speech, Ray Dean. Thank you so much. We also talked to Mayor Benji, Mayor Benji Magalong, two weeks ago, right after we got um, knowledge that it was a go for March 6. He was very excited. He said, sure, Mia, sabi niya. He forgot, you know, he's a very busy man. <laughs> Family comes first. He needed to bring his mama to the airport because she's leaving for the States again. So of course, mama comes first. But he sent us his lovely executive assi assistant, Miss Samantha Hamada, and she will give a Mayor Benji speech on his behalf. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To Sir Ray Dean Salvasa and the entire academy um, industry, to Patay Kidlat, Nanay Katrin, to Sir Flanking Simatu, Tita Mia Magdalena, to Sir Gabe Mercado, Tita Lucy Maranan, Sir Albert Gamboa, our friends from the media, and everyone present here today, good afternoon. Please accept my well wishes of good health and safety to everyone present here today. Mayor Benji, as Tita Mia has mentioned, that cannot join us this afternoon because family does come first. But he would like to extend his warmest regards to everyone present here today. On behalf of Mayor Benji and the entire LGU, uh, Baguio LGU, it is an honor to be here to commemorate the release of Maria Reza's book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator. Man Reza is an accomplished journalist and activist who has made significant contributions to the Philippines and beyond. Her message of standing up to democracy and truth is more important now than ever before. The city government of Baguio has come to appreciate the role of a free press and the significance of journalists like Ma'am Reza in keeping those in power accountable. Without a free press, corruption will continue to plague our society and the voices of the people can be silenced. In the Philippines, we have seen the dangers of a government that seeks to suppress dissent and the weakening institutions of check and balance. But we have also seen the power of people coming together to demand change and stand up for their rights. Man Ress's work embodies the spirit of unity and resilience, reminding us that we can make a difference even in the face of oppression. This leads me now to my next point. 
Here in the city of Baguio, we have built an administration on the foundation of good governance. Good governance is not just about having strong institutions or enacting laws and policies. It is about serving the people and creating a society that is fair, just, and equitable for all. We must remain transparent in our actions and accountable to the people. Good governance also means creating a system that is inclusive and empowers all members of society, regardless of their background and circumstances. Moreover, good governance involves a commitment to integrity, honesty, purity, fairness, purity of intentions rather, and a constant effort to improve the lives of our countrymen. Good governance goes beyond traditional politics and is not only focused on fighting corruption, it is about inclusiveness, empowerment, dynamism, and authentic leadership. I am proud to share with all of you that we have made corruption obsolete and irrelevant in the city of Baguio. Mayor Benji is starting a movement among local chief executives, private sectors, private institutions, and even individuals to join his cause who firmly believe in, his principle, in the principle of good governance. And I personally would like to invite all of you to join this cause. He soon hopes that this will become a powerful movement and evolve into a pandemic similar to the COVID virus and become contagious so that we can infect other LGUs with the good governance virus. If we can do it here in Baguio, imagine what we can do, what, how the nation can transform if good governance, if genuine governance can truly exist. Seeing that there are many members of the youth here, I being among one of those people, Mayor Benji has always said that we need to invest our youth in our youth now more than ever. Because the future belongs to us. What will be left of our generation if we continue to, to let greed, apathy, and corruption prosper. As public servants working in government, in the national and local level, we have to create a legacy that we can pass on to the next generation. Mayor Benji hates the term future leaders because in fact, to the youth, I am addressing the youth right now, if someone addresses you as future leaders, you should feel insulted. Because age should never be a factor in leadership. We should grab the opportunity now because we are all capable for change. As you engage in today's event, I hope that you will all speak up and challenge the status quo. Your voice and actions matter. You all hold so much potential and we need fresh ideas that many of you can deliver. I would like to congratulate Mamlesa on the baggy leg of her book launch. Thank you for your tireless efforts to defend democracy and human rights, fight corruption, and stand up for the truth. Your work is an inspiration to us all and a reminder that we must continue to stand up for what is right. Even if going for the right direction, not many of us choose to follow. Let us work together to create a more just, and democratic world. I wish you all a pleasant day ahead. Maraming salamat. Mabuhay po kayong lahat.
Maraming salamat, Samantha, and thank you, Mayor Benji. We wish your mom safe travels. Before we proceed to the um, book reviews, there will be a question and answer portion later. So those from the general public who might have questions, please approach the media desk here at the, on my left side here and let them know. And now, giving a brief reviews of how to stand up to a dictator are J. Albert Gamboa and Luchi Maranan. Albert came up from Manila to attend this event. Thank you, Albert. He was a recipient of the 2021 Golden Quill Award bestowed by the International Association of Business Communicators during the IABC World Conference in New York City. He was also an editor and consultant of several Manila broadsheets and journals. Luchi Maranan. Hi, Luchi. <laughs> Luchi Maranan is a writer superstar in Baguio. Being a, <laughs> Being a past president of the Baguio Writers Group and a poet, editor, anthologized here and abroad. Last year, she translated Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude into Isang Daang Taon ng Pag-iisa. She was also the editor of Panaglagip, The North Remembers an anthology of stories about martial law in the North, which was launched only last week. I give the mic to Albert and to Luchi. So we will have Albert here first before going to Luchi. Thank you, Mia, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Frank, for uh, inviting me to this book launch of Maria. Um, Good afternoon to the people of Baguio, to the literati and the civil society of Baguio, and the government officials uh, represented by um, uh, Ms. Samantha, and the uh, civil society with uh, Sir Kidlat, um, also the faculty and students of uh, UC, huh? which I understand is observing your 77th anniversary this year. Um, okay, uh, let me start by saying that my presence here, my attendance here, is uh, both personal and professional. I first uh, met Maria in 1998 uh, when she was the maid of honor in the wedding of my sister-in-law, Twink Makarei. Twink, yes, that's the Twink whom she mentioned so many times in this book. And um, she was uh, her BFF from grade school in St. Scholasticus, Manila. No? Um, at that time, Maria was the CNN bureau chief in Jakarta, and she almost missed the wedding because that was uh, during uh, one of the developing stories at that time. Indonesia was in turmoil, and uh, that was because of the fall of Suharto, no? who was uh, in power for 38 years. Yes. So um, that was my first um, encounter with Maria. And then next to that was in 2004 uh, at the Phoenix conference. Phoenix is the association of CFOs and uh, financial executives. Um, she was our guest speaker. And at that time, her first book, uh, Seeds of Terror, had just been published. Uh, and I, I was editor-in-chief at the, uh, that time of uh, Phoenix Digest. So we featured her in the cover, our cover story titled uh, Seeds, uh, Breaking News with CNN's Maria Reza. Uh, and then last year, I was asked to be the moderator of the Phoenix Forum, where Maria was the keynote speaker. And she gave us a preview of her third book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, which was about to be released in the US and the UK. You know? When it became available in fully booked, uh, Rockwell, Rockwell last December, my wife Nina and I uh, ordered multiple cop copies and of course, the first thing we did was to look for the chapter about Twink. Uh, but to our surprise, Maria f uh, featured her in several uh, chapters. No? So since then, I've read the entire book twice 
And uh, my overall rating for it is uh, 9.5 out of 10. Yes. It's very powerful, compelling, and inspiring. I especially like the way Maria juxtaposed her personal journey against a backdrop of parallel events that shaped the country and the world in the last half century. Uh, let me focus on three chapters. Uh, chapter four, um, is, uh, has, she made the statement that the, the quality of our democracy is just as good as the quality of our journalism. I really uh, found that very powerful. Um, that's on page 69. And then on page uh, 76, uh, she talked about emergent behavior. Uh, and uh, she turned out to be, she was like the clearinghouse of intelligence for so many sec uh, sectors, the military, the media, the police, the business sector, because she had inside info on what was happening on the ground and behind the scenes. No? So um, there was just one factual error, um, page 79. Uh, <laughs> Um, Gabi Lopez was not imprisoned. He wasn't the one jailed. It was his father, Henny Lopez. He was also jailed. He was? He was, yeah. Oh, yeah. first time I, I found out. Okay. <laughs> so I stand corrected. So it's now 9.9 .9 <laughs> out of 10. <laughs> okay. Um, but Albert later shot in a jail, right? Like it was first the father, they broke him out, Escapo, if oh, you guys yeah, remember yeah, the, movie, the film. Yeah. And then he got jailed later. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, chapter 11, um, it's when you said that, um, um, you quoted somebody who said, colonialism has moved online. No? Um, and that's also where you, uh, had uh, revelations about Cambridge Analytica and SCL, no? the, the parent organization, and how they um, influenced the Philippine elections in 2016, and also the U.S. elections uh, in 2016. Um, and then chapter 12, uh, you have insights from Soshana uh, on surveillance capitalism which uh, I also featured in Phoenix Digest, uh, uh, the docudrama of Netflix uh, titled the, the, the Social Dilemma. So um, let me focus on page 252, where you had um, your, um, you had some analysis of the May 2022 elections here. Um, I was surprised that uh, you were not able to um, mention that there is this group of IT professionals who have been um, who have investigated the massive fraud in May 2022. I don't know if the audience here is familiar with that. That's the group of General uh, Eli, uh, Eliseo Rio, who was former DICT secretary. Acting Secretary, uh, Gas Lagman, who was Comelec Chairman, uh, Comelec Commissioner, and Frank Isaac, who was our president in Phoenix before. No, they're called the TNT Trio, and they've been um, doing all these uh, investigations uh, using IT, and they found out that there was no transmission at all during the first hour of the counting, uh, the supposed counting on May 9, so um, the, the first hour, it said that 8.02, there were 20 million votes that were transmitted. From their findings, there was no transmission at all. The first transmission was at 8.05 p.m. from a precinct, a single precinct in Paranaque. So the, the ones before that were probably pre-programmed. So they've been asking Comelec to Produce the transmission logs. Comelec has not produced it, um, and they now they have a case now in the Supreme Court to compel Comelec to produce it. If not, that means the election there was a failure of election. 
for both the presidential and vice presidential uh, positions. So I'm, I just wonder why um, Rappler has not covered that. Um, they had so many uh, press conferences last year. Um, they had one in, uh, in Quezon City at the Pandesal Forum in Kamuning Bakery. Another one in, um, I think that was in uh, uh, Robinson, so uh, one of the malls. Um, and then when they went to the Supreme Court, they have daily um, vigils there. So I, I hope Rappler will look into that, maybe through Fact Check Philippines, um, Fact Check PH. Um, regarding the findings of um, fraud in May 2022. So um, that's, uh, it was also mentioned in the prologue. No? I think that uh, you already considered the elections as um, fate accompli. Uh, so maybe you should look back, uh, you should try to, to uh, uh, investigate it further mm, because I will tweet the article on it. You can see some of it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just tweet it easier. Okay, okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, what I also found interesting about the book is the behind-the-scenes accounts of her encounters with political and business leaders, like uh, Malaysia's Mahathir, uh, Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew, Indonesia's uh, Megawati, and of course, the Philippines' Cory Aquino. At the Phoenix Annual Conference last October, Maria said, we are now in the last two minutes of democracy as fascist leaders have become dominant worldwide. But recent developments in Brazil and Malaysia have given us hope that the tide of authoritarianism might be fading and the pendulum will, be, will now swing back to democratic leadership, starting with Latin America and Southeast Asia. So um, indeed, this 300-page volume is a must-read for every Filipino who values press freedom and democracy. Congratulations, Maria. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Good afternoon to everybody. I was fortunate enough to be provided with an audio book, copy of uh, uh, Maria Ressa's book. And of course, uh, because the usual suspect, Frank Simatu, um, coerced me <laughs> to do a review, but I'm really more than deeply honored to have um, engaged in marathon listening to this nine-hour uh, audiobook of Maria Reza. The arduous journey on the road less traveled by Maria Reza is marked by testaments of grit and determination of a journalist whose continued persecution by a despotic regime is known globally. She's both cherished and admired, loathed and reviled, depending on whose lens she is regarded and viewed. But she tells us in this book that a divided world where power and money determine the rules was never her wish as a growing Filipino-American. Her youth was fraught with uncertainty and isolation as a result of the sudden departure from her native land in the 1970s. The insecurities and loneliness growing up were matched with her determination to excel and be the best she could be in her fields of interest. 
She shares that early on, she had discerned the justness of standing up to bullies and against discrimination. While she nourished the profound value and comforting warmth of true friendships and camaraderie. While her family settled in New Jersey and she assimilated into the American culture, she nurtured and affirmed her Filipino identity by remaining connected to the momentous events that transpired in her birth country, such as the restiveness of the people during the despotic rule of Marcos Sr. A sense of purpose, putting premium on honesty, leadership, and determination, molded her into the journalist who is strong-willed, idealistic, and battle-scarred in all sense of the word. In her book, Miss Ressa traces the parallel trajectory of her country's recent history with her path to establishing herself in the mass media industry, becoming the tinik salalamunan of the powers that be. The political turbulence birthed the brand of journalism that Miss Ressa strove to build and strengthen. A docile mass media was perturbed by the stirring created by a daring journalism that targeted corruption, violence, impunity by the state on one hand, and self-censorship of the media on the other, that had been habituated to cultural to dictatorships and be beholden to corporate interests. Fueled by ideals of integrity and credibility, Ms. Ressa, with her formidable probe team, forged head-on with their investigative journalism. These hallmarks of her profession would later lead her to her CNN position when she covered international news. Then on to, this, to her foray as into the news management at ABS-CBN until she helped establish Rappler, whose goal was to rap and create ripples in the mass media. But they instead created waves that disturbed the status quo with potent and far-reaching influence of, of citizen journalism. Transparency, responsibility, accountability, trust in the community, truth and justice above politics. These were and are the mantra of a journalist that has been tempered by the crucibles of succeeding administrations. As a woman and a journalist in the time of tyranny, misogyny, and impunity, it takes more than courage and fortitude to parry the attacks from all fronts, especially when the law has been weaponized and social media serves as a platform for deliberate behavioral and social manipulation by governments in collusion with capitalists who rake in profits by mining data of information consumers in social media platforms such as Facebook. The deluge of technological advances and the speed of delivery of these have resulted in the dearth of, anal of analysis and understanding by consumers of information to the benefit of despotic governments. The power of this information sways over the uneducated and impoverished. Thus, Ms. Ressa implores, implores the journalist to take on the multifarious roles of a sociologist, 
a political and cultural analyst, and demolish the myth of objective journalism. So-called balanced reporting on the crimes of a tyrant or denial of the pandemic and climate crisis contributes to the miseducation and misinformation of an already morally impoverished nation. Instead of helping the people make informed decisions to improve their social economic conditions, and furthermore, to take back their humanity that has been robbed by poverty and hypnotized into apathy. Independent journalism is the antidote to tyranny, says Ms. Reza. And this is how she stands up to a dictator and tyrants in the making. No amount of red tagging and insidious attacks or insidious tactics such as filing of cyber libel cases by the NTF, LCAC, and their mouthpieces will intimidate and silence dissent by activists, human rights defenders, and truth bearers. As long as those in power control the narrative, journalists have to continue to hold the line and speak truth to power. As the world reels in economic and political turbulence, the calm and composed journalist under fire emerges from the chaos and is awarded a Nobel Peace Prize and urges her fellow mass media compatriots to take on their moral responsibility to create a better future for all. In closing, just two days before the commemoration of International Day of Working Women, we salute the woman, tiny in size, but magnificent and bold in spirit, who gives dictators and apologists their sleepless nights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luci and Albert, for your reflective, enlightening, and powerful reviews. Um, I read the book too. <laughs> And it's not your typical page turner. Why do I say that? Because every paragraph or so, or sometimes even after one sentence, I have to stop, I have to think, and one point, at one point I even ugly cried. Why? Because um, I too am a woman, and I too am fighting for truths and for freedom of expression, and many of Maria's truths are so relatable. And it still happens. It happens to the students. It happens to the women. Every time, online, offline. And um, it's a fight. And we will always hold the line with you, Maria. Thank you. So before we proceed to a better introduction of who Maria is and the Q&A portion, May I um, call to stage, uh, Gabe, before you do your part, we will do the blessing first by our national artist, Kidlat Tahimik. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. I greet our fellow survivors of the Panabenga <laughs> traffic hill or our Karmagedon as uh, Frank Simatu wrote in his editorial. Um, 
The last time po I was on this stage was uh, about three years ago. Uh, University of Cordilleras honored me with an honorary doctorate. <laughs> and I was pleased about a semester later, uh, they conferred another doctorate honoris causa on our guest speaker today. And siguro, wow, magka-alumni na pala rin tayo. Although uh, may seniority na ako by one semester. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I'm glad to be here to, um, well, may dumating na email last week that said, uh, you will be on the program, and item number three, uh, you will do a blessing ritual. <laughs> I'm not even ordained. Hindi po ako pastor. I'm not a bishop. How would that sound, Bishop Kidlat? Hindi ako mambaki or mambuno, or I'm just a baggy boy who maybe, yeah. In my simple way, as a, also as a national artist, maybe I cannot do a blessing. Baka pag mag-blessing ako, baka, baka kidlatin tayo. <laughs> but I think I can do a little personal invitation to the spirits of the mountains, mga batala ng mga bundok, kabundukan, to join us for this occasion. And it's of, join uh, mga lovers of press freedom to... Uh, listen and be with us today. I hapo kabunyan. I know. Um, alam nyo, itong panawin ho natin ngayon, isang internationally recognized palipas na nalo ng Nobel Peace Prize. Pero ngayon ay may napakabigat na libel case hanging on her head. And hapo kabunyan, meron rin tayong isang local boy, journalista rin, local editor ng local paper, at siya rin tinututukan ng libel suit. Sana po, hapo kabunyan, bigyan ng lakas ang ating mga kapatid na si Maria Reza at si Frank Simatu para yung lakas ng kanilang ginagawa para tuloy-tuloy ang kanilang pagsulat na walang kaba, walang takot, walang panganib so they can continue writing towards the truth. Yan po sana, it's not a blessing, it's just an invitation to join us. And I know that we all here in Baguio share in our concerns about the many issues that concern the press. But let me also add, sana po, apo ko ba niyan, bigyan niyo rin ang lakas ang ating mga artists ng Cordillera, and I consider journalists also among the artists, uh, para Yung kultura natin ay tuloy-tuloy mabuhay at ang ating mga kaalaman tungkol sa kalikasan ng ating mga lolo at lola ay tuloy-tuloy magising ulit kasi kailangan sa labanan against climate change and all our environmental issues. So for our freedom of Press Day and our Freedom of Artistic Expression. Umay kayo! Apo ko po niyan! Hey, hey! I am sure Kabunyan has heard us. Now, multi-hyphenated Gabe Mercado. Improvisational theater actor and trainer, hyphen, advertising model, 
Hi international fan. model. International yeah. advertising model. Hi fan, rock star, vocalist of the police. Hi fan, cat lover. Hi fan, director of Vivita Philippines slash my daughter's boss. <laughs> Hi fan, Baguio resident. We'll now introduce the author. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, have you ever been to a concert na ang dami-daming front act and you just really want the main rock star to come on? Yes. I have been there, so I'm going to do you all a favor and make this with Maria's blessing as sweet and as light as possible because all the previous people before me did a great job to tell you all the great and serious things about Maria. So, dahil ang Pilipino mahilig sa mga na, mnemonic like um, NDRRMC, NTFLCAC, etc., I will make a mnemonic to introduce Maria. And the mnemonic is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Ready? Okay. A, B, C. Maria, always be careful. Because as we know, we had to spread this in private groups because in this day and age, kahit Nobel Peace Prize winner, kahit, kahit person of the year ng time, kahit influential person of time, we still have to be careful because of the good job that she's been doing, fighting and being courageous for us. So ABC Maria, always be careful. <laughs> DEF for all of us, don't ever forget. Don't ever forget our dark past. Don't ever forget the things that we should remember from our own history that it takes courageous voices like Maria to remind us of. G-H-I. Maria, go home immediately. <laughs> um, because she has a busy schedule, she just arrived here 1 a.m. last night. Uwi na siya bukas. So um, thank you for the time spent with us, but yeah, GHI, go home immediately. <laughs> For all of us, from Maria's point of view, JKLM, just keep loving me. <laughs> because of the cases that she is being persecuted with libel hanggang ngayon. All those cases that the past administration put up against her and Rappler, hanggang ngayon, she's fighting that they need our love and support up to today. They need our support. And I'm happy that we're here showing our support and love for her. Palapit na matapos. N-O-P-Q-R-S-T-U-V-W. No one person quite right so truly understands very well. And indeed, her incisive writing in her books, including this book, which I'm sure all of you are raring to get signed. It's unparalleled. Um, the brilliance oozes from every word. Sabi nga ni Mia, every sentence, every page, ugly cry. And finally, X, Y, Z. I'm happy to see my boss again, because at one time she was my boss. So Maria, um, XYZ, see you soon. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to proceed with the Q&A for Maria Rasa. Angela and Gabe, grab it. I'm so, uh, thank you the, for that very alphabetical um, introduction to Maria. And we now have so many new acronyms that we know. Thank you. How to stand up to a dictator is both a biography and manifesto. And you all have your chances to have your book signed and take a photo with Maria later. It's a very engaging read. And for the Q&A, we will accommodate eight questions from the audience with one follow-up question only. And first, to give his question, may I welcome to the stage the editor-in-chief of the Baguio Chronicle, Frank Simato. Hello, Maria. Hi, 
Frank? You have to give the lay first. Oh, you. There. Yeah, and you and you sit beside her and Frank. That's not the way to put a lay. Oh my goodness. It's not a sash frame. Oh my it, it's the other way around. When it's upside down. There we go. Thank you so much, Frank. What a wonderful job. You can now sit in the middle and give your question. There we go. Beautiful. And please stand by for the next question. Yeah, I, I was with uh, Maria in 19... When Marcus was buried. That's the first time I met you and was... Uh, had a crash. Like in the motion, have you? Anyway, um, and then uh, right now we have a new Marcos. Should we bury him, or are you going to? <laughs> are you going to come up with a new book about uh, this Marcos? Oh my lord! Oh, should I answer? Okay, yes, oh, Maria. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, first of all, can I just say thank you, thank you, thank ah. you, thank you. Welcome, um, you're welcome. It, it, your time, your presence, all the words, so incredible. Uh, you know, Gabe was, uh, was our attempt at ABS in 2005 to put oh. Filipino values up front. Remember? You don't remember the show. Nakasalakot siya, tapos, it, Pinoy ako. Pinoy ako. Noi, and then, sorry, so evolution of our ano, it's, it became Noipi because he's funnier than we are. <laughs> and so he made it Noipi. And that was the same time we launched Bandila. Wow. But that was our attempt. Like, I, I was like, why can't being Pinoy be cool? And so they only gave me the late night thoughts. But it was, it was our attempt. So the question. <laughs> I just came from Cologne in Germany, where if you remember, hashtag never again began in Germany with Hitler. So Lit Cologne is the largest international festival, literary festival. And um, they looked to us, they asked us, they asked me the same question, which is, Marcos is back. And I said, well, we also have hashtag never again, but we also have back to the future. Right. So, and I, Albert, I'm going to take some of what you said. I think what this cell phone has done is it has made facts debatable because these social media platforms, these American technology companies, then you add TikTok, Chinese companies, actually want to keep your attention and they do that by hacking our emotions, our biology. So why do you keep scrolling if you're afraid, if you're angry, if you're hateful? MIT said that lies spread at least six times faster than facts on social media. So if you want to spread something, lie. Imagine if you told your child, lie, I'll reward you. Keep lying, I'll keep rewarding you. That's the corruption in our information ecosystem. Okay, so back to Frank's question. When lies are rewarded, everything turns upside down. And you know, Netflix, the Stranger Things, we're in the upside down. And everything is vaguely familiar, pero it's covered with goo and and it's oozy, and we know we have to somehow get right side up. I don't believe our values have changed. So now we come to today, to your question. I'm always asked, so is it better under Marcos? And my answer is very simple. I just had 34 years of potential prison lifted off my shoulders. Last month, yeah. right, four tax evasion cases, all criminal. The court finally threw it out after four years and two months. <laughs> but we went through four years and two months, right? So 
why am I telling you that? Because we hit such a low point. It was so bad when murder was an everyday occurrence, when extrajudicial killings, when our reporter would come home every night beginning 2016, we only had one reporter out at night and they would come home with an average of eight dead bodies, videos of eight dead bodies every night. And then the police itself said that during that time period, an average of 33 people were killed every night. And online, anyone who questioned that on Facebook was bashed to silence, right? That narrative taken out. Okay, so when we come from something like that, anything is better. It is better. And we have to acknowledge that regardless of who you're for or against, right? Are the killings still happening? Um, the, there's an EU group delegation that came in last week, two weeks ago, members of parliament who reminded us that a preferential trade agreement, GSP Plus, is coming up in December. And along with that are human rights and press freedom issues, right? So my short question, my short answer to that question is, we have to live our way into the answer. This President Marcos won overwhelmingly. Albert, the reason why Rappler didn't carry that is because we didn't find strong evidence to support doing the story. And, and Gus Lagman is a close friend, right? Nothing personal, only the facts. Um, Lenny Robredo said that there wasn't any significant cheating. We went with NAMFREL, with PPCRV, because in the end, losers, and I don't mean all of, we have to accept shared facts so we can begin to build. Shared fact, we have a President Marcos, who in his first 100 days traveled more internationally than any other president we have ever had. He cares about the rest of the world. He believes the economy must be front and center. What do we do as journalists? We hold the administration accountable for corruption, if we see it. But we have all felt a lifting of fear, and we should acknowledge that, right? Not taking either side, but taking, in the book I talk about, the present moment of the past. What's the present moment of the past? It comes from T.S. Eliot, Tradition and the Individual Talent. He said that the fact that you read this latest novel is influenced by the fact that you read Shakespeare. And your understanding of Shakespeare is affected by the latest novel you read. This is our lives. This is our history. Do not lose our history, that is actually up to each of us. So what uh, you look, people paint Rappler, power paints Rappler as, you know, I'm both CIA and a communist, I can't figure out how do I do that, but you know, <laughs> people will paint you and social media will allow the lies to spread faster. Yeah. So we must fight back and it becomes an individual battle for facts, for integrity, for truth. Now I will shut up. <laughs> I guess I'm just saying present moment of the past. We will weigh on the side of evidence. We will weigh on the side of truth, right? You have to leave your emotions behind. And boy, do I have a lot of emotions. But I've learned to take anger and bury it at the pit of my stomach so we can have clarity of thought. And like Mayor Magalong said, you know, like move it forward with good governance um, because we need that. And the world is in a strange place right now. We are on the verge globally of losing democracy. And we Filipinos are at the forefront of the attack against it and hopefully of the solution. Okay. Thank you, Maria. I follow up. Frank. 
Okay. Sige, sige. Uh, you still yeah. have a question, Fred? Yeah, yeah, just one. Um, okay. Baguio Chronicle um, joined the uh, Rappler in fact first at PH. Yes. And I remember we, we fact checked uh, your first uh, book launch that somebody, somebody crazy, said that uh, only one attended your, fact, your book, book launch. Book launch. Anyway, um, do you think uh, we're making a difference, our fact checking? Big time. Oh, that's yeah, cool. parang ganito siya. And the reason why I said, you know, we moved Baguio, yeah. because literally Baguio moves the Philippines, right? So, <laughs> think about it, right? Like, so, Baguio Chronicle is a small news organization that is part of 16 news organizations, part of a whole of society approach to protecting the facts, or another way of saying this is an influencer marketing campaign for facts, right? It's a four-layer pyramid. It's a whole of society approach. 16 news groups in layer one that does fact checks, they're really boring. They don't spread on social media. So the layer two, the mesh, are civil society, 114 different groups that are sharing those fact checks, but they share it with emotion and they cannot use anger, right? And you know what we found? That inspiration spreads as fast as anger. The third layer are academics who are analyzing how we're being manipulated, and the fourth layer, the last one, are lawyers, the legal groups that in less than three months filed 20 plus cases to protect the pyramid. I'm telling you about that because Baguio Chronicle was among the most courageous, the most undaunted, the most vocal, right? Which, when you're together with 16 other news organizations, spreads courage. They were, so every person in this room, in your area of influence, that is the mesh. You spread your courage. It ripples through society. And in the book, it ripples through three degrees of influence. We can talk more about that. But the last thing is you see. Of course you see. I don't know if you remember, but in 2019, I began getting arrested every few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so parang, I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years, starting February 13th, 2019. And Ray, Salvosa, and UC, you know, at a time when Rappler, hmm, we were kryptonite. People were shunning us to a degree because no one wanted to get targeted. UC gave me <laughs> an honorary award. So, This is why Baguio, you stand up. We have a lot of problems in our country, and you have a lot of problems here, but what it takes to solve it is every person in the room standing up and creating a mesh and connecting the mesh and demanding better. So yes, the facts first PH pyramid worked. We were able to, we mapped this, take over the center of the information ecosystem on Facebook. That's pretty tough. Mm. And it was so successful, it is now being replicated in other countries around the world that will have elections. Yay. The last point. There are, between now and 2024, 90, 90 elections globally. Wow. If you don't have an integrity of facts, you cannot have integrity of elections. This is the reason why, as of last year, at least 60% of the world today is being governed by autocrats. We are under authoritarian rule because we are, with social media, electing illiberal leaders democratically. And then when they take over, they crush the institutions of democracy from within, and they don't stay in their countries. They ally globally, which was part of the reason we're pushing the UN and UNESCO 
to stand up for the values, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It always goes back to values, right? 2024 is the tipping point. When we looked at the number of elections coming up by 2024, if there is no regulation in place for these technology companies, we will lose democracy, right? Three major elections, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim population, India, the world's largest democracy. Modi has been in power since 2014. He was accused of human rights violations. And he, like our president today, couldn't travel to the United States until he was democratically elected. The last one, of course, is the US elections in 2014. We have a lot at stake. You coming here today, you know, the book asks, what are you willing to sacrifice for the truth for the facts, for your community. I think Baguio shows us the way. Thank you, Maria. So Baguio, courage on. And I see many of you are taking notes, but um, please know that we're on live stream. We're on UC, Rappler, and Baguio Chronicle. So if you missed anything, you'll be able to watch it again later. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Next we go to the inquirer's Kim Kitasol for her question. Please stand by Sherwin De Vera of Rappler. Ayan, buti nilang abot ko po yung mic. <laughs> Hello. Hi po. Yes, um, I am also from the Northern Dispatch, the local online. Um, yes. Yeah. We, we have been also working with Rappler. Ah, uh, yeah, truth, truth telling. Um, it, in connection to the earlier discussion about Frank's question about the fight for truth, truth tellers are under attack, and that is a fact. Uh, particularly the use of cyber libel and libel um, cases against truth tellers here in Baguio. Frank, <laughs> unfortunately, um, is also guilty. <laughs> His case um, was um, also, uh, judged guilty um, of cyber libel. What I'm trying to say is that there are those like me who get away with it, but many do not. Um, like Frank, for example, here, and um, an activist, uh, Sarah Dekdeken, who is also in the audience right now. Um, as part of our pushback, there is a campaign to decriminalize libel, but of course, uh, it's not moving. It's like stuck. So I'm just maybe asking how we can um, make this move uh, and actually realize this goal of not just decriminalizing it, but actually scrapping the whole law in itself. Because even before it was passed, it was being questioned already. But like the anti-terror law, it was passed. So I think that's what I wanted to know, what we can do. What more can we do? But we are already at the edge of, uh, have we done enough? What else can we do? Thank you. Thank you so much for your work and the, the question. I think first, we're seeing movement forward on the cyber libel, on decriminalization of cyber libel. And in a weird way, what's horrible is it takes us first, you know, God, there's no wood for me to tap on, but, you know, the fact that that I could go to jail for nearly seven years for, a, you know, I can't, so I'm no longer under a travel permit because I also now have to ask the Supreme Court for permission to travel. No, as part of that permission is I cannot talk about the cyber libel case in broad terms. So let me say, there's a new administration um, as part of a focus on the economy, hello, hello. it also requires an integration to these global standards. And call me crazy, but these global standards have put pressure. We now see, um, again, GSP Plus is very interesting because President Marcos went to Brussels in December last year and met with the EU, one EU country can take that privilege away. It is necessary for our economy. The Philippines has now, controversial or not, moved forward on EDCA, 
right? This has become a place where the, there's this phrase in Indonesia, in Indonesian where, you know, when the, when the elephants play, the mice get out of the way. <laughs> I can't remember the actual phrase, but there's what's happened with Ukraine, Russia invading Ukraine has impacted the rest of the world. Now there's China and the threat China poses. The alliances with both China and the United States and Russia are shifting into different places. Both the UN and the EU are also kicking in. I'm saying all of this even though we're talking about the decriminalization of libel. Um, you have Senator Rafi Alunan, who himself has had to deal with this. You have other senators who have put forward versions of the bill. You also have in the House another version of the decriminalization of libel. This is a good time to actually push that forward and in a weird way to use all of us who are not guilty. I don't even know if I can say that right now, right? I mean, look, what I can say is I didn't write, edit, or supervise a story that was published eight years before the law we allegedly violated existed. That's a statement of fact. That's how you can get around sub judice law. <laughs> statement of fact. So the fact that this is being used to create a chilling effect on journalists, this is the time to bring that up. And as our new administration kicks in, to, to look at the lawmakers who are there and take it forward with the ones who have. I mean, I, this is partly because of the focus on the journalists and the activists who have been charged. I mean, Rappler also, at one point, whew, I'm going to say over 50, um, the Kiboloi supporters filed 50 complaints all of which were thrown out of court. But the statistics of how libel and cyber libel have clogged courtrooms are very good reasons yeah. for the judiciary, for the, the executive and the, and the legislative to look at how to make government more efficient. It's a fudgy answer because we never know until we do. It doesn't happen until it does. So Northern Alliance, you've also dealt with your own, with the problems in, in many ways that other news groups haven't. I think we have to keep pushing forward. We have to hold the line and push it forward to reclaim our rights. It's the only option ahead. Thank you. Thank you. That's true. Many of us face cases, cyber libel complaints. I myself had to face three. So that's enough already of weaponizing cyber libel. Frank there and Maria. So now we have Sherwin De Vera of Rappler and the Northern Dispatch. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, I was with uh, the Addis Rufo Fellowship last year during the election, actually. So, and I continue to contribute for Rappler. Um, the, uh, the internet and social media actually um, made the world a smaller place for us. Yes. No? But it has also bred uh, data capitalism no? and put uh, the uh, hate crime no? at a certain level. So I was wondering, where are we now in holding these big tech companies uh, accountable for, uh, for allowing um, fake news and hate, online hate calls uh, to spread? And my second question would be, from our po end, the community media especially, um, where do we play in the big campaign to hold them accountable? No? Because uh, I, I believe Rappler is doing its, its uh, share on that and also other uh, international news agencies. So, saan kami doon para sa community media? Thank you, Sharon. So first, like, what's the solution? Over a timeline, the present moment of the past, right? In the long term, and we need to start now, it's education. So we need to do the stories that show you how manipulative, 
how we are Pavlov's dogs, right? How they are experimenting on us and how social media has become a behavior modification system. The studies are there. I will treat, tweet them as well, right? But these are some of the things I put in the Nobel lecture. Long-term education. Um, uh, Medium-term, it's legislation. And that's part of the reason I have traveled so much internationally. I think I've testified in almost every democratic nation's um, debate about what type of legislation, because some of them say, America among them, this is a free speech issue, because that's what the tech lobby say. They spent $70 million last year. The tech lobby is like the tobacco lobby in the past. They're shifting it away from the harm that social media has done and continues to do to deflect, to deny. Uh, the legislation now, today, as of last year, the EU came up with the Demo Democratic Democracy Action Plan, which has two laws, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. That is kicking in. And by spring this year, what's important about those two laws is it looks not at the content, not at the speech, but at the algorithms. Algorithm is opinion in code. It's like Frank made a choice, and then an algorithm replicated the choice millions of times. That algorithm is what is insidiously manipulating us. So the legislation now is looking at how to make it transparent and accountable. In the short term, it is just us. It is the facts first PH pyramid. It is every reporter asking the tough questions. You know, when I when I was with CNN and ABS and Rappler, the things I loved the most is when a reporter stands and faces power. If you remember Pia Renata asking President yeah. Duterte, and President Duterte towering over her and taking away the microphone, essentially. But yet, the reporter continues to ask. For me, we journalists have to keep doing our jobs, but the, Nobel, the Norwegian Nobel Committee gave the Peace Prize in 2021 to journalists. But in 2022, it gave the Peace Prize to civil society. Mm. It gave it to civil society groups from Russia, uh, Belarus, and Ukraine. And so we need to work together now in a way that we never have before, because this is the only way to fight back against the lies. So I guess as we are trying to rethink what journalism will become, I'm working on things like I co-chair the International Fund for Public Interest Media, which was created in 2019. My co-chair is the former president of the New York Times. Last year, we raised $50 million from governments for independent media, dapat mag ano kayo, <laughs> for independent media, particularly in the global south, because we need money to survive, yeah. and then the laws will take care of the systematic problems. Why do they spread lies faster than facts? Because they make more money that way. Yes. And then what do we give up because we're on the platforms? Meaning time, where you spend your time, determines whether your life has meaning. And spending it on your phone scrolling is not the right way to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sherwin. <laughs> Next, we have Sarah Dukan of the Cordillera People's Alliance, followed by Orville of UP. Sarah. Yes, hello, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Ako po si Bestang Sarah Dakdakan, ang Secretary General ngayon ng Cordillera People's Alliance. Hindi po ako member ng press, pero ako man po ay hindi lang din kinasuhan ng cyber libel, kundi na-convict last uh, December, last year. Actually, magkasunod kami ni Frank. Sir Frank doon sa pagka-convict sa cyber libel cases. Um, yung, yung case sa akin was filed by uh, the former chief of police dito sa Cordillera, uh, the brigade, Brigadier General 
Erwin Pagkalinawan. This was in relation to yung desecration ng, at uh, demolition ng Monument of Heroes ng anti-Chikodam people's struggles. So yung, yung pagkakaso ng Trump up cases sa amin ay nag Tuloy-tuloy siya mula nung panahon ni Duterte hanggang ngayon. In fact, very recently, uh, lima sa mga kasamahan ko sa Cordillera People's Alliance at dalawang aktivista mula sa Ilocos ang kinasuhan naman ng, ng uh, rebellion uh, by the PNP also. So, syempre, Trump up case, it was baseless at dapat may basura. Um, kami po ay... Uh, umaapila ng supor suporta mula kay Miss Maria Reza at uh, sa atin pong lahat ng mga nandito na sana ay matigil itong pag, uh, pagpipila ng mga gawagawang kaso sa mga human rights defenders, sa environmental activists, sa indigenous leaders. So, tanong po kay Miss Maria Reza, paano ba natin papatigilin itong pagpipila ng uh, libel cases? Uh, uh, Ano po ang maipapayo ninyo sa mamamayan, halimbawa sa mamamayan ng Cordillera dahil tayo ay nandito ngayon sa Baguio on, on how to fight this information and the weaponization of the laws against activists, against indigenous peoples para sana hindi lalong matakot yung mas marami. And I think it is a fact na at this point ng matinding political repression ay indeed marami ang natatakot magsalita. Yan po. Maraming salamat sa tanong. I mean, first of all, you named it. It is the weaponization of the law. And the end goal is a chilling effect, right? This is, why did I get 10 arrest warrants? You know, it was because they thought that that would stop us from doing our jobs. How did we keep going? Maybe I can just talk about some of the lessons and they will be hopefully helpful. Because the weaponization of the law weakens the law ultimately, right? And and that has ripple effects in our country that goes right back to business and governance. So in this case, one of the things that we did is to actually organize. This was something used. Legal cases were used against journalists globally. So what we did is we began to form an alliance of, of, it was a group that began to raise money to help smaller news organizations fight um, legally. Because it, it's a war of attrition. If, you know, in, when Rappler, when we got our first shutdown order in January 2018, within four months, we lost 49% of our advertising revenue. And if we didn't pivot, we would have had to shut down by the end of 2018. But you know, Nietzsche's quote is also correct. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. <laughs> They're so fun. It forced us to find an alternative business model that wasn't advertising dependent, that actually made us stronger in the long term. So by the time the lockdown happened in coronavirus, we were growing while other news groups were laying off people. Look at it now as a problem of logistics and a possible opportunity, right? How do we do this? So how can you maintain to keep fighting back on the law? Right? How do you maintain the focus? You have to shine the light. For us journalists, it's the only weapon a journalist has. We shine the light, we do the stories, and we were lucky enough to have other journalists tell our stories. Maybe these are some of the things we can talk about, because this is part of what the Facts First PH Pyramid has done. If you notice now, right, there are outdated notions that are being resuscitated, like red tagging, yeah. <laughs> like the Communist Party that is dead in many parts of the world, all of a sudden is, in my case, working with the CIA. These are ridiculous <laughs> things, right? And so I think part of it is organize in the real world, find the defense in the real world. We have, in the Facts First PH um, pyramid, lawyers who have taken the cases mm. of, our, of the people who were targeted. Uh, and they continue to do this pro bono, 
right? I think this is a long-winded answer to say, we're in the valley of death, <laughs> or we were. I would even say we're coming out of it slightly, right? Um, if you're a startup in Silicon Valley, 99% of the startups die. But the ones who survive live through, slingshot through the valley of death. We've already hit the bottom and we're moving up. That's a good answer to you. Um, and so it is about pulling the mesh together, identifying the problems, leaving the, prob the, the wars of the past, but focusing on the present moment of the past. And I think this is a, a new time, and we need to reformulate um, some of these stuff we can talk about, but don't let it daunt you. Marami salamat po sa inspiration, Ms. Maria Reza. Now we have a student from the University of the Philippines, Baguio, Orville, to be followed. Oh, it's going to be Nash from the La Salian, to be followed by Kayser. Hello po, I'm Orville. I'm not from Orville, you people. Orville, sorry, you have the same hair as Nash. So it's Orville, it's Orville. Hi, Orville. Hello po, I'm not from you people. Oh, you're not from you either. Where are you from? <laughs> sorry. Immediate corrections. Frank, I'm fact-checking you right now. You made my list. Uh, I'm Orville po from Kilosko Youth, Baguio ah, Benguet you. chapter. Okay. A youth arm of former Senator Kiko Pangilinan. Uh, here's my question po. You have been an icon of resistance, or still an icon of resistance. How will you encourage the youth to stand with the truth? And what are the ways we, the youth, can participate in protecting and strengthening democracy? Maraming salamat, Orville. It's a great question. And you know what? You know, um, so I did a lot of terrorism stories. One man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. The glass is half empty, half full. Both of those things are always true, right? And the worst of times is the best of times as well. Because think about it like this. Every day, I wake up and I don't look at the up until January, there was 75 years in prison that I could go to. Everyone asked me, so why? And I'm think, looking at it and I'm thinking, I'm not going to let that stop me. Because what's exciting? We have never lived through anything like this globally. You have as much power as a veteran, <laughs> i.e., matanda na kami. <laughs> um, and you can actually shift and mold. I mean, our team will tell you this, our Gen Zs, <laughs> which we debate all the time, if you look at our production team, you know, um, the youth have as much to contribute as those who are old and sana wise, but also scarred. Sometimes we fight the battles of the past, and we need the energy of the youth to anchor us and to build better forward, right? Sana totoo po yung unity na yan na sinasabi. Kasi kung totoo po yan, my gosh, where can this country go? Um, there's a shift on social media now. You're seeing that uh, the tech companies themselves are already deprioritizing news, right? We know this. Uh, and so we need to build real world communities. Anong ginagawa ng mga kaibigan mo? The friends of your parents, right? Because I don't, I don't think we have different values. The values, the Philippines is one of the first signers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, madami kang pwedeng gawin. The youth infuses us with energy and we wake up every day. Everything, in Rappler right now, we're going through an assessment where what do we want to build? Not just for today, but for your generation, I point to, you know, because my generation, I'm a little older than Frank, we kind of lost it. I mean, 
We are where we are today for a whole lot of different reasons, right? But not enough of us stood up. You are inheriting a world where climate change is, a, is set to extinguish us. I mean, it is existential. You are inherit. Baguio knows this, right? Sustainable development, the 17 sustainable development goals, which have been pushed aside because we can't agree on the facts, because the lies are winning. So it's your generation that bears the brunt. It's your kids that will do it. So jump in. Help create every day. That's part of what they do. I can't imagine they do as much as they do with the few people they have, but they do. Or maingay lang sila. Pero yun. So please don't be, don't be daunted. This is a time where, where we can act and we must. Yes, po. A follow-up question po. Medyo mabigat po ito. Sige, go ahead. Analyzing our current legislative body, are we looking at another Ninoy Aquino? A Ninoy Aquino of our present time? Ang hirap eh, parang speculative na to, di ba? I mean, in this sense, you know, uh, I, it's hard, I struggle, because back to the future, ang ano, di ba? But I guess part of it is, we go back to accountability, we go back to doing the stories, we give everyone an equal chance, and that includes some of the people who we know who has a track record of doing things that have gone against the law. They're in, it's, the perfect example is actually President Marcos, right? Like Prime Minister Modi in India. We democratically elected him. And we need to collectively hold his government to account. If he succeeds, we succeed. If he fails, we fail. Thank you. Um, Ma'am Marissa, can I just jump on the fact that we have a youth who is speaking up on what they can contribute to what we are facing now as a country. Again, speaking on behalf of Mayor Magalong, um, I would like to... Ako, personally, this is my first time representing Mayor Magalong. This is the first time he appointed me as his representative, yeah. someone who is part of the youth. And um, I would like, San po si Kuya? Kuya? Ayun, ayun. Um, I would like to inspire you and all your other peers to speak up. Now, now is the time that your voice is needed more than ever. Um, especially in the world, in the country that we are facing in the type of government that we are facing, now is the time that you get to speak up because what we are facing now as a government is what will, will, what will dictate your life, our life, in what, how many years to come. So if you do not speak now, um, people say that we do not have a voice of because we are young. But that shouldn't be the case. Whatever we are facing now, whatever we are, what they are lining up now, is what we will experience in the future. Tayo naman yun nakaramdam nun. So I hope that um, all of you get to um, have a voice in any political decision, in any decision-making process that we will have here in the city or in the national level. Thanks, Samantha. Yes, the government, the government needs the youth. Let's bring them into government. Next year, we'll have barangay elections. So let's bring the youth in. Next year, right? This year, this year. I'm sorry, this year. This year. I got stuck so there in the upside June, down. June, July. Yeah, all right. Next, we have Kaiser from UP. Another member of the youth. Yes, Stand by I'm this. the one from UP. Yeah. Yes, you're the one. 
Uh -huh. And I think Orville's from yeah. Asoli, right? Yeah. Yes. So, hello, Miss Maria. I'm going to divert a little uh, something about what Mr. Kidlat uh, was assertive about earlier. Uh, but this is still about responsible journalism. And uh, I actually host a radio commentary uh, show every weekend. Uh, this is a cross-generational platform, so I represent the Gen Z, the youth. In this show, we discuss um, sometimes about uh, climate change, food security, agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, uh, my co-host, former Isabella Governor Grace Padaka, um, he was, I, I, I'm sorry, she was, um, she was assertive about uh, illegal logging in the Sherry Madras in our province and. Bago siya umalis as a governor, talagang naging mainit yung pangalan niya because of defending the environment. Now, um, the thing is, I only see a few coverages uh, of climate stories in the mainstream media. That's why in our radio show, we talk about this all the time, almost every week. And why do you think that mainstream journalism or the mainstream press should be covering more about the changing climate, environment, and all this? I mean, thank you for the question, but first, um, please realize that, that media journalists have been under attack for the last six years. Mm -hmm. um, ABS-CBN is a perfect example. Yeah. Shutting down 21 regional network groups had a tremendous impact on our nation's ability to weather typhoons. Right. We have an average of 20 typhoons every year, and we know, you know, one of the things that we were trying to do before the Duterte administration was hashtag zero casualty. It, it's a civic engagement arm, Move PH, working with other news groups, working with government. Mm -hmm. Our goal was to bring hundreds down to tens, down to hashtag zero casualty. All of that was thrown aside um, when, uh, when the Duterte administration came in. And, you know, it had its own priorities. So I guess my, the quick answer to your question is, journalists, when journalists are under attack, the quality of your information goes down. Could we have done more climate change stories in Rappler? Absolutely, if I didn't have to spend as much money on legal fees <laughs> as I have, oh. right? Or could we have, you know, instead of trying to Pieranada at the palace, get a straight answer that comes at midnight or maybe never, um, could she have done climate change? Because climate is her passion, right? Yes. So again, what happens when the quality of information, de when the quality decreases, it is most likely the fault of journalists. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, this is in the book, the quality of a nation's, of a democracy's journalist determines the quality of the democracy. Because in the end, please make, make this very, very clear, because I think sometimes in, our, in the generation for social media, they can't tell the difference between PR influencer and journalism, right. right? Journalists are not out there for popularity. Mm -hmm. Our goal, we have a set of standards and ethics. The goal is to hold power to account. And we're willing to go to jail to do that. Um, so the right answer, the right risk, the easy response is stop attacking the news organizations and let them do their jobs. And that will serve the public better, and we can better prepare for existential problems like climate change. Uh, so what is Rappler doing now? Are you, uh, do you offer um, climate stories to independent journalists? Or? Yes. So this is actually part of the pivot. Right. So the other part, Orville, your question, right? Kaiser. When we began Rappler, well, okay. Orville, or, uh, I think, Orville's question. Yeah, he first asked this, right? So, so what we've always done in Rappler, at the beginning in 2012, there were only, I went from managing 1,000 people in ABS-CBN to 12 people. Mm. And the 12 people, there were only four or five of us above 40. Then we hired the smartest 20-somethings we could find wow. because we knew what we didn't know, right. digital. Mm. It teaches you something different, right? So it was that partnership that helped create the 
first generation of Rappler that took us to 2016. 2016 was Rappler at war, mm. right? Rappler struggling to survive. Then we had to kick back in the oldies like me. <laughs> this generation, this one in the Marcos administration, well, now that I've gotten 34 years of jail, potential jail thrown out, um, we have another, there are three other cases and one dormant, so actually four, we're pivoting again, looking at the next generation because you would manage a Rappler differently than me, mm. right? Our views of the world are different. This is the kind of like merging that we need to have. Um, I like to think about it as the creativity and passion of youth with the supposed wisdom of the aged <laughs> you know, <laughs> experience, <good> <laughs> with the experience. And that's how we're going to move it forward. So um, climate change is a major priority for Rappler, but I cannot wait to finish these legal cases because they're still there right. so that we can actually focus yes. on what matters. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you, Kayser. Next, we have Lays from UP, followed by Franklin of UC. Hi, Maria. I am a journalism educator from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. I've been teaching for two decades. And it has, been increasingly, it has become increasingly harder to encourage students to pursue journalism, the field of journalism. You are actually a double-edged sword. You are a Nobel Peace Prize winner, so that's inspiring. But at the same time, um, you have so many attacks going against you. Um, last semester, at the end of my news writing course, I asked my students, could you honestly tell me, could you honestly tell me whether or not you're interested in pursuing journ? And at least half of the class said, I don't think I can. Um, and part of it stems from the fear of what they're facing, the fear of dying newspaper industries, of the fear of being overtaken by other content creators and having to muddle through so many cases and so many threats even coming from the authorities. When Frank asked me to come on, ask a question, I would have jokingly asked, how do you stand up to the son of a dictator? But hearing your description of how you feel that this administration has, has made it better compared to the previous one, I've, I said, okay, let's not ask Totoo that question. Hindi. Do you think or not? Um, I feel like it's not, but... Say why, please. I feel like it's not because it's still the same situation abounds for journalists. The killings may have stopped. Uh, it's not as blatant or it's not as, you know, don't, you don't hear so much derogatory words, but... The mere fact that there is, um, he's trying to avoid addressing issues that the country is facing, it makes it a lot more harder because facts and truth cannot come out. And you hear of the 31 million now turning their backs or saying, nagsisisi kami, kahit may trickle, trickle pa rin, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't feel better uh, with inflation, with all the costs rising, it doesn't feel better. Yeah. And you juxtapose that to a president who keeps traveling abroad, so much so that he gets into jeopardy as Ferdinand Magellan Jr. <laughs> but anyway, ma, uh, that's where I'm coming from as an educator. No, no, no. I, I, yeah. I, think, I think that's great. But y let me try to convince you a little bit why. <laughs> right? From the perspective of Rappler. Yeah. Right? Remember February 2018. Um, uh, just a month after my, the government tried to shut us down, our, we were banned from the palace. Pia and I were banned from the palace. And then that slowly extended to every Rappler. Like we couldn't even go cover Duterte outside the Philippines, right? So that was, the Marcos administration actually took our reporter in his plane. Um, and. You know, I guess part of it is I feel, and please change my mind. I'm really, 
what, what we're trying to do is chronicle the, the, this shift up. As we chronicled the descent into the valley of death, we try to chronicle the way forward because the, the social media platforms literally polarize us, right? But we have to agree on certain facts together and we need to move forward and we're going to need optimism and hope to do that. That doesn't mean we're not gonna expose a corruption scandal if we see it, boy, like kleptocracy is kleptocracy regardless. But in the moment, if you ask me, we can cover, we can ride with the president. Does that mean that you know, his supporters didn't try to harm one of my reporters during the campaign? That doesn't get rid of it. But if I were to dwell on that without moving forward, then I don't take into account the present moment of the past. So for me, I'm, I'm still very up, I have to remain optimistic. We only have one life, we only have one country. So, so yun lang, uh, and I'm not absolving anyone of anything. If anything, we will work harder than before, but we must acknowledge that if we were here, we're here. So yun, but yeah, yeah, please yeah. ask the, uh, yeah, you, were, I, you were asking a question. Yeah, That's I, the only reason, because I'm very aware I don't want to. I get that it's a process also. And you yes. have to let him yes. run the course. Anyway, we're here for what the next five years or so. So, yes, uh, we get that too. So, um, my Jim. question really is that's why I veered my question towards this, and I say that you are you know, you're a double-edged sword. You're yes. both inspiring and at the same time discouraging. And from the context of a journalism teacher who has seen the changes over these past 20 years and the different attitudes and characteristics of students. How do we continue inspiring the next generation of journalists? And how do we encourage them to continue holding the line? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Um, the first, I think, is that the book talks about how everything is power and money, power and money. As a journalist, you run after power and money, right? It, it, when I was covering terrorist attacks, I was follow the money and you will find where there is something wrong. Journalism is about something else. It is about the search for truth, meaning, and the best of what humanity can do. I became a journalist when you know, journalism was the most, um, it was the most trusted, most credible. That even in Pulse Asia, you could see this during this time period, right? And I guess what's happened now with social media, as it destroyed the facts, it destroyed trust. Remember these three sentences I've said over and over since 2016? Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality. We can't have democracy. So I look at this at the young journalists today, and you know, one of our co-founders, Chai Hofilenya, is teaching in Ateneo. Um, it's teaching journalism. It's almost like a culling period. In the past, we would all flock to journalism because it was the most credible, it was you could get paid well, none of those things are true today anymore. <laughs> the business model is dead, which means the pay gets lower and it is under attack, right? But it isn't just journalism under attack. It's also gender disinformation that is attacking every woman, whether you're a researcher or a public official or a journalist. Right? So all of those things, even if you don't go into, a jour into journalism, if you're a woman and you're walking into a public sphere, you will. If you do something meaningful, you will come under attack. So I think about today's journalists as almost a culling. It's the same thing when I was hiring for ABS-CBN. The key characteristic I looked for was courage. When you have that, Innovation grows out of that, right? So I don't think it's for everyone. And I'll, I'll end with this one. When, when the government tried to shut us down in January 2018, 
January 15th, I remember all these dates. So January 15th, 2018, they tried to shut us down. We held a general assembly with Rapplers. There were about 100 of us at that point. And I knew it was going to be different. Rappler is 63% women. The median age is 23 years old, the median age of the Philippines. We're young and women. Not by design. We keep looking for men. We don't have courage. So what we did when we met with everyone is I said, because I was worried their parents would be worried. Right? So I, said, I actually talked about what we were going through, how we are walking into a different time, and that we would now have to hold the line. Hold the line is pretty passive if you think about it, right? Because it's the line where our rights are guaranteed by the Constitution, and no matter how much you try to bully me, I'm not stepping off the line, right? That's the, that's the idea behind it. But neither am I gonna punch you in the face, right? So hold the line. When I talked to our folks, I offered, I said, if this is too much, if you want to move to another news organization, let us know, and we will help you look for a job. None of our reporters took the offer. Oh. So that's where I have hope. You know, it, it will be there, and hopefully, you know what's at stake. Our democracy's at stake. When you walk into this profession, you will walk onto the front lines. All right. Uh, so. Yeah, this was asked to me, um, why are we still uh, having journalism classes, diba? Everything's down, we're being uh, discredited. You know? That's why I chose Albert, uh, Lucci, and uh, Gay, because we are storytellers. Eh? Essentially, uh, we're the ones at the bonfire <laughs> telling the good stories. Um, you, you name Moto Koy. Uh, Moto. Writing well is the best revenge, diba? Moto. Writing well is the best revenge. Uh, add facts and you're the winner. So, kailangan pa rin natin ng journalist. Um, because uh, we need to discern facts and we need to write stories, uh, tell stories. You know. uh, mga trolls, hindi pa nga makapag uh, perfect grammar, diba? So, we have an edge. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Frank. Uh, if you're curious who these women are, Maria, they are Beneco MCOs. So they're member consumers of Beneco, and they have also been fighting their own war against trolls and disinformation. So that is why they feel everything that's happening. I'm sorry because we're pressed for time. We cannot entertain any more questions. But let us move on. To a thank you message before that, Maria, can I request you to please stand here in front as our Emma comes to give you her message of thanks. Good afternoon, everybody, and to you, Miss Ressa. Good afternoon. I first want to say that it is a very much appreciated honor to be here today to hear you speak and share your stories firsthand. I can't believe that I'm in the presence of the first Filipino to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize. Imagine, out of hundreds and thousands of people, Your fight was acknowledged to send a message that real journalism shows the truth. Aren't you proud? <laughs> Isn't the country proud? If it isn't, it should be. <laughs> when I was asked to speak today, I wasn't sure what to say. What would a 10-year-old like me share about? 
And then my mom suggested I should talk about something I can't say about. Um, that's Harry Potter. <laughs> when I think about what you've done, it reminds me of the story and the brave characters in Harry Potter. Like you, Harry was singled out and seen as a real threat. Like you, some tried to silence him, and like you, he didn't give up. Like you, Harry Potter had within himself a strong power that made Voldemort afraid and want to destroy him. You have that same special strength inside of you, and you've shared it with the world. Your special power is making sure the truth is not silenced. When Harry tried to speak the truth that Voldemort really was back, many tried to deny it. And so he was punished with cuts on his arm and was attacked by Dementors. He even had to stand trial. Sound familiar? <laughs> <coughs> and still, he kept fighting for the truth and what is right like you did. I have no doubt that the sorting hat would have placed you in Gryffindor for being a brave and courageous person. But at the end of the day, unlike you, Harry is a fictional character. And to be a real person facing real challenges is much harder. You're probably going through struggles every single day. Your life may even be in danger. And some things you do or say can be used to hurt you even as you try to do the right thing. You've been forced to be so strong and brave in your fight for a truth and peace and democracy. But like you said, you don't really know who you are until you're forced to fight for it. <laughs> Unlike a fictional story, we don't know what's going to happen next. We won't know if everything will work out in the end. All we can do is hold the line. Recently, we discussed heroes of social justice in school, and I chose to research and make a speech about an activist named Susan B. Anthony. She was a famous American woman who fought for women's rights to vote and own property. Like you, she had a strong moral compass. Her actions led to many good changes, and I can see your actions will do the same. So, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you. You've inspired many people to tell the truth. You've helped them learn the truth, and you've helped me learn the truth too. You've encouraged all of us to stand for the truth. Because of you, we can be even prouder to be Filipino. You've done so much to fight for what is right. What you do matters, especially to the young like me because it teaches us that the truth really does help us make a better and friendlier world. When I look around this room, I feel hopeful. I think it's safe to say that all of us that are here today are amazed by what you have done and all your accomplishments. We have all gathered here, like Dumbledore's army, to show you how much we support you. And we are proud to be a part of the fight for our future. Like you, and because of you, I choose to believe that there is good in the world. And even if it takes seven Harry Potter books, good will win in the end. When I did my research about you, I was so amazed by what you have done. I even came across a video called 11 Things You May Not Know About Maria Ressa <laughs> by Rappler. The 12th mystery fact was she can skateboard. <laughs> when I found about this, I realized you're not just smart and brave, you're awesome and cool too. <laughs> Congratulations on your new book, 
How to stand up to a dictator, the fight for our future. I think what the world really needs is paper, a pen, the truth, and more people like you. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone, except you Voldemort, wherever you are. Look at that, Emma. You have inspired everyone with your beautiful speech. Thank you. I'm Emma Louise Orendine, and I've just met my real life favorite hero. Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Emma. Emma, why don't you sit with them on the sofa? <laughs> They deserve your presence there. <laughs> Thank you again. Now, may I please call to stage um, Mr. Paolo Salvosa and the Vice President also, um, Rodora Molo, to present to Maria their Certificate of Appreciation and their token. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. Um, on behalf of the University of the Cordilleras, uh, we'd like to thank our distinguished guest, Maria Ressa, and uh, the other distinguished guests we have on stage, and also to everyone who made uh, time today. We know you all have busy schedules. Um, it's always been a philosophy of the university ever since uh, my grandfather founded it that education uh, should be a shield against tyranny and it should, be, it should light a torch against the darkness. And because of everyone here today, uh, we hold that shield together with you uh, much stronger because of everyone's presence here. And the torch on the uh, shield shines even brighter. And we hope it will spread more from here. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. It's very Aresa. The moment that many of you have been waiting for, the book signing and the photographs with Maria. So we're going to change the set um, to give also Maria a chance to, use, uh, to have a short break. So we'll have a five minute break while we change. Um, the signing will be done on stage. There will be two lines, all right? Thank you, Albert. Sorry, we couldn't do the question anymore. Um, There'll be two lines, one for the seniors and the PWD, um, and then there will be another line, both on this side, for the regular, uh, for the general public. What we will do is we will take turns, okay? We get one from the senior citizen line and then one from the regular line, and that's how it's going to be. Now, I suggest that you use the toilet if you need to because, you know, it takes quite some time. All right, quiet now, quiet now, a few rules. <laughs> I know you're all excited. Yes, yes, tanggalin na. Ay, bagya ka.
I think that's what's nice about him. I mean, because he does. He held the line. The process now shifting into the next generation. Listen, they really will manage differently. And I want to go back to recording. <laughs> really?